Welcome to this podcast review for April 9th, 2024, and I'm Jada Duran. And I'm Brennan Cassidy. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody, for what is to be a really fun conversation tonight mm-hmm. as we are recording this. It's been quite hectic, to be honest. It has Brennan's been a day. <laughs> been, been, been dealing day. with some things <laughs> over there in Pennsylvania Right now, as we are recording this, CinemaCon is going on. They just unleashed the trailer for the Joker sequel, which, as we all predicted, the conversation right now is it's very pretty polite. normal. It's very, it's very polite. <laughs> cordial. No controversy at it, it all. Seems, it seems as though most people are rightfully still interested in the news around Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis getting a can competition screen. Yes. That seems more important, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That news dropped earlier today as well, Yeah, which is very exciting. The whole narrative around that film is crazy to me. We've yeah, already talked about how <laughs> he spent, what, $120 million of his own money to produce it. He's mm-hmm. shown it to studio executives they don't know what to think of it which is very they don't exciting. yeah I, I, I feel i feel like the narrative is that they don't want it which i don't know if that's true it's more so how do we market it which to your point probably means it's gonna rule it's gonna be a really interesting yeah. movie but it's interesting how the timing of that announcement uh that it's gonna premiere at con and actually com- compete at con came right after these reports that studios don't know what to do with it i, yeah. I think that's incredible <laughs> love timing. that yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Khan is certainly willing to take it. And I yeah. am very excited to see what the reactions for it will be. As long as we get it, that's all that matters. If it hits I just theaters see in it. some way, shape, or form, yeah, I just want access to it. I fully expect that it's going to be a massive flop. And he's going to good. lose 120 million dollars. I mean, on not this not project. not good. I, I and I, and I know how he's able to fund a lot of his movies through his wine business. And first off, I really like his wine, uh, the Coppola wine. I think it's great. Uh, but it's it's interesting how he's one of those filmmakers that really is a one for me, one for you kind of person. Quite literally, especially when you look at the 80s and how movies like Apocalypse Now, One from the Heart, completely bankrupt bankrupt him <laughs> to have to make yeah. movies like Peggy Sue Got Married. The more we talk about him, that would be a great filmmaker for a movie series. Perhaps we should let our listeners tell us if they want to hear that. Yeah, perhaps that is something we get into at some point. Either way, one of the best. That's not what we're here to talk about. I mostly wanted to bring that up because (laughs) there's so much happening right now on the film side of things. There's a lot of interesting news dropping. We're, of course, preparing for this show. Simultaneously, my... Detroit Red Wings are essentially in a playoff game and are the most disappointing thing on the planet. So there's that as well. (laughs) (laughs) Jeez, the way you describe them, it sounds like you're Detroit Lions. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, for a long time, the Lions have been for a long time, historically speaking. So it's like they're trading off the badness, I guess. Yeah, this is a relatively new thing for the Red Wings. I mean, they haven't been in the playoffs in seven, eight years, but still. But still, to be they're this bad. in the hunt. It's essentially a playoff game. If they win tonight, they're they control their own destiny. But of course, right. that's not what's happening. So, <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear it that. is what it is. I'm I'm grieving uh, for you and your uh, your Red Wings there. <laughs> However, we're not here to sulk. We can save that for another time. We're here to yeah. celebrate Dev Patel's directorial debut and his film Monkey Man. Mm-hmm. which is a miracle that it exists on its own right. We can talk sure. about Megalopolis and the production narrative there. The production story around Monkey Man is equally fascinating. Mm-hmm. And that is fun to talk about. Perhaps we can get into that. The trailer yeah. drops, what, a couple months ago and it got people really excited. I do believe this premiered at Sundance or South By. I can't remember which one. And yeah, one the, the response is were quite electric coming out of that. Mm -hmm. So here we are. 
Monkey Man, it finally releases. We got a chance to see it, and uh, I'm excited to get into this. Same here. So, without further ado, Monkey Man is directed by Dev Patel. It stars, you're not going to believe this, Dev Patel. Alongside, how about that? How about that? <laughs> Char- Charlotte Cobley, Pito Bosch, Fippin Charma, Sikander Kerr, and a few others that come and go throughout the film. If you're not familiar with Monkey Man, it is about, it says here, an anonymous young man who is credited mm. as the kid. He's also credited as Monkey Man. He's also credited as Bobby. He goes by all three <laughs> names throughout this film, which I think is interesting and hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I think for the sake of this conversation, we'll call him Bobby. That makes the most sense. Sure. Maybe we, we can, can refer go with to that. him as Monkey Man. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll go back and forth. Perhaps we'll avoid calling him Monkey Man so it doesn't sound like we're confusing it with the name of the movie simultaneously. Uh, I think Bobby's yeah. probably the way to go. Absolutely. Kid yeah. is also a bit weird to me because it's Dev Patel who is, what, mid-30s? You know... Early 30s? Weirdly, he's I not still a kid. See, is my he's point? Not a he's kid. not a child. <laughs> he still has a bit of a youthfulness to him, and maybe it's because the first yeah. thing we saw him in was was Slumdog Millionaire, where he was still a kid. I think he was maybe seventeen or eighteen when he made that movie. He is thirty three, uh, so by the way. Yeah, so he's not a kid. Um, I mean, I don't know. I still sometimes think mid thirties is still kid like nowadays for the millennial generation. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. He's not a kid, even though we might still see him as that <laughs> if we grew up with him in a certain way. Exactly. At any rate, all of that to say, it is about Monkey Man slash Kid slash Bobby, who unleashes a campaign of vengeance against the corrupt leaders who murdered his mother. Spoiler alert. Whoever wrote that synopsis. Actually, that's not really a spoiler. It isn't murdered. But it it, it kind of reveals itself later, right? Like it doesn't. It's it's not one of the. It is. It isn't. We can talk about it. Yeah, we could talk about it. It's a little bit of an interesting setup when compared to other revenge films of its kind. Mm, for sure. But I guess to finish that thought off, it is about Bobby who unleashes a campaign of vengeance against the corrupt leaders who murdered his mother and continue to systematically victimize the poor and powerless. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, with all of that, Out of the way, Brennan, what did you think about Monkey Man? Well, as you mentioned there, the production of this movie is certainly fascinating, and I assume you're going to get into some of that, so I'll let you kind of talk to some of that as well. But one thing I do want to talk about first is really just how interesting that this specific movie exists in this way, because I think that's some of the best things that we can say about it. It's not Mm -hmm. just that it's a action thriller from Dev Patel, but it's sort of his reasons for wanting to make it, which I think are really interesting uh, because apparently, and I, 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 there is an interview with him. It may have been with variety. I don't have the source in front of me right now where he said for some of his life, especially in his youth as a kid, maybe that's where the name comes from. He felt sort of like he needed to distance himself from his Indian roots and his Indian culture. And in many ways, this movie monkey man is him getting reacclimated to those roots and wanting to share that with the world. Because what's so mm-hmm. interesting about Monkey Man as a film, for me at least, is its cultural representation. Uh, because not just narratively speaking, we sort of talked about this with that plot synopsis that the setup is kind of vague in some ways. It sort of just drops us in the middle of a narrative. Uh, but it also drops us in the middle of Mumbai in this city. And we Mm -hmm. sort of just have to kind of experience it in an alien like way. If we're not familiar with this culture or this heritage. And I, I found that really interesting. The fact that that cast list you named there, it's really only Dev Patel as the recognizable name and maybe Charto Copley, but he hasn't really been in as much since some of his earlier works with Neil Blomkamp, for instance, Mm -hmm. it's just, it's so interesting that the name that's really marketing this movie outside of maybe Dev Patel, it's Jordan Peele. Of all people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but real. clearly he and Monkey Paw Productions saw something here that they felt was worth showing, and I think just for those reasons, culturally speaking, the film is worth seeing. Uh, and I do think, as a directorial debut, 
it's kind of surprising how ambitious and stylized that it is. Uh, like, like, is it perfect? No, I don't think the film is perfect, but the reasons I think it's imperfect, I do think are interesting. I'll get to those later, uh, but I do want to focus more on the cultural representation going on here. Uh, but it is a very stylized movie from a first time director, maybe does trip over some of those ambitions at times, but I'm glad Dev Patel went for it and went for mm -hmm. it in this way. Uh, and you can tell based on the final product, he clearly had an admiration for his roots and wanting to share mm -hmm. that in this way and the story that he tells, even if it maybe doesn't do anything new socially or politically from a broader standpoint. I like this particular sliver and this world that it's showcasing it in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for those reasons, the film is very interesting, and especially by the third act, very entertaining. I absolutely, with every fiber of my being, loved this movie. I okay. I, I really can't wait for this conversation. I really can't. This is top 10 of the year material for me. I'm wow. that high on it. I'm it, it, that high on it. Yes. So okay, I, I don't I don't want to spoil things too far because we're not even at our mid year report yet. Is this your number one of the year as it stands, or is that still maybe Dune Part Two? One uh, A and one B. So so it's Monkey Dune. Look, I look. <laughs> I, I'll say this: Dune is a better movie. Mm -hmm. We'll get into it in the conversation here. Sure. I don't know if everything works here, but. I love, love, love the swings it takes. Sure. And, and we talk about that a lot, right? It lands for me more than it does, than it doesn't. Um, okay. It's, it's really fantastic. So 1A and 1B, as far as I'm concerned. I would still argue wow. Dune is the better movie, but I don't think Monkey Man is that far behind. Okay. Cool. I think one of the better qualities of this film is that it's not overly complicated in terms of narrative or thematic structure. Right. But that simplicity leaves room for, as you're talking about, cultural specificity and yeah. also emotional nuance. It's the mm -hmm. same formula of that first John Wick. It just replaces yeah. the world building and lore of John Wick with the legend of the Hanuman and Bobby's tragic childhood, which right. I think is a brilliant foundation because, for one, we know that it works, but primarily it gives way to Dev Patel's ambitious filmmaking and evocative cinematography, which mm -hmm. is astounding in this film. I was blown away by it. The dilapidated okay. yellow hues of the underground boxing club are extremely vivid. The dark neon redolent streets in the city are reminiscent of something like Wong Kar Wai. The red and darker color palette of the okay. luxury brothel is striking. The framing and composition here is stunning for a first time filmmaker. The kind of audacious vision that he deploys is mesmerizing. The film's symbolism and how it's emotionally rooted to Bobby's childhood, something Patel never loses sight of, injecting it onto the frame as much as he can, is really great. There's an unabashed passion and conviction to Patel's direction that is undeniable. Not mm -hmm. that contagious devotion alone makes a film great. It doesn't. A lot of films have a spirit but stumble along the way. It's Patel's assiduous storytelling and how he marries action with thematic and emotional substance. Mm -hmm. I don't dislike mindless action films, but this is anything but that. It does have something to say, right, and right. it does so with a precise and earnest rapture that artistically hits on every level for me. Okay. I've said this a, a million times. Give me this kind of ambition and craft all day. Faults and I'm, all, I'm, I want this ambition. I love I'm, it. I I'm, eat it up. Ma, 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 ma. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And some of the stuff that Dev Patel employs here to, you know, to, to, to visualize those action sequences specifically. I think like GoPros were used at times as well. There's a couple first person shots too that he gets pretty creative with some of the uh some of the visual flair and the language here, which I think is really ambitious. And I love that he takes those swings. And you're right that there is a rather compelling uh parallel between the filmmaking itself and how that parallels uh, Bobby and his journey. Uh, it weirdly kind of matches his emotional headspace, which is why 
Really, the biggest issue I might take with Dev Patel's direction, I kind of think is on purpose and deliberate. Uh, the first half of this movie is very dizzying and disorienting in a way that's almost indescribable. Uh, it, it, it utilizes a lot of extreme close-ups on characters. Sometimes the camera still wobbles a little bit as it does so. So the the depth of field is very thin, it almost seems like. And even when he gets into some of those early hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes, at least the first major one, it's kind of sloppy. In a weird way, this is going to sound terrible. It kind of reminded me of the sequels to Taken <laughs> in some ways. like It, it almost had a really mm. discombobulated feel to it. It's not until we get to the third act where I realized maybe that's on purpose because our main character there at that time is very inexperienced. He's in over his head. He is sloppy. He fails miserably, completely. Because by the time we get to that third act and the same energy is still being employed in those action sequences, all of a sudden it's clearer. All of a sudden there, there, there's a consistency to it that I was able to follow along. And maybe that was just me being, I guess, a little like not ready for that style at first and getting used to it as the film went along. I, I was probably able to warm up to it a little bit. But I do think it's interesting to see that potential sloppiness really go hand in hand with a character's journey. Uh, as if Dev Patel, mm -hmm. the, the man behind the camera, is the exact same as the man in front of the camera. Uh, and we sometimes see that whether like we, JD, we just talked about directors who are also the stars in their own films, right? We talked a lot about Charlie Chaplin, Clint Eastwood. And in some mm -hmm. ways, the films that they star and that they've also directed are mirrors of themselves behind the camera as well. They kind of work mm -hmm. synergistically like that. I yeah. feel like the same thing's happening here. Uh, like Dev Patel getting in touch with his own Indian culture once again. Uh, and the lack of experience he may have and as he tries to learn along the way, it's like him telling that story to himself and to us simultaneously. And I, I, I mm -hmm. think that's a really interesting storytelling approach. Yeah, that's a fascinating interpretation, one that I, at this moment, do not share, but I do okay. absolutely adore that perspective. I think that's fascinating. <laughs> I really do. I simply did not have that reaction. I think okay. the filmmaking, the composition, again, the, the color palette, the use of hues, I found all of it striking, especially when it's interwoven with the editing and how that circles back to the film's pathos, I think is all pretty consistent and striking. And I love okay. the fight choreography. We can talk about that as we go. However, I do share your sentiment there on the trajectory of Bobby yeah. throughout the film and how that unravels, I think is really great. We see him early on the first time we see the kid monkey man, if you will, he has the gorilla mask as you have probably seen in the marketing and the mm -hmm. trailers. And mm -hmm. I do love how cool that is. He clearly knows his way around the ring, but I do love how Patel sets him up by taking more punches than he does throwing them. Initially, he is anything but John Wick. No. He's mm. clearly motivated, and I do love the pseudo-ambiguity. I mean, Patel doesn't spell it out, to your point earlier, but at the same mm. time, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out his emotional outrage. It's in right. per Patel's performance, for sure. You see his grief and anger, but it's cogently woven into the camera work, the close-ups and attention on the Rana Singh character, the chief mm -hmm. played by Sikander Kerr, which yeah. clues us into his backstory. Same thing with the insert shots of the kid's tragic childhood that are meticulously framed to inform the audience without revealing everything all at once. I think sure. Patel rides that line very well. It's lucid storytelling, but with artistic purpose and ambition something Patel taps into further once the dramatic urgency of the film becomes more prominent. And we see that his conviction alone isn't good enough. He's motivated, yeah. but perhaps lacking an identity or a spiritual core, which makes him formidable yet vulnerable at the same time. Patel isn't afraid to demonstrate both sides of that coin. Bobby mm -hmm. takes his fair share of blows in this film in that first half. It's not until he's rescued by Alpha and yeah. the Temple of 
Arden Harishvara, where he begins to solidify his purpose, where he's able to channel his grief into a spiritual foundation, which in turn makes him this unstoppable force on the other side. It's not reinventing the wheel. Again, right. it's narratively pretty simple, but there aren't many action films, at least to us here in the States, that have this cultural specificity. And when you couple that with the film's emotional underbelly, its spiritual symbolism, and its visual ambition, mm -hmm. that makes for an utterly engrossing well, experience. And this is why I don't want a sequel to this. And I know Dev Patel is being asked about that quite a bit already in some interviews promoting the movie, is whether this could be something that is franchisable. Right. And isn't it mm. sad that that's the question many people go to nowadays when a movie is a big it's hit? all What's studios it, want is IP. <laughs> what is it going to set up? What is it going to set up? And yeah. I, I don't care what it's set up here completes its own arc and it's a decent arc already. It doesn't need to, you know, it doesn't need to continue. Uh, but I do love the lack of lore here. Uh, it, this is not meant to be a John Wick to the point that we're getting like a John Wick chapter five eventually, right? It's not confirmed, mm -hmm. but we're probably going to get that. Uh, that. That's not the necessity here. This is meant to be its own unique thing. And one of the things I also love too, and why I don't want any type of sequel lightest happening here, any type of lore uh, built upon this existing film already, it mm -hmm. is that simplicity that we keep dancing around. And mm -hmm. a lot of that's also due to Dev Patel's performance. I mentioned the name charlie chaplin earlier but like, like his performance here is kind of chaplin-esque almost buster keaton-esque at times and i say that because mm -hmm. it's very physical it's very acrobatic apparently dev patel yep. suffered quite a few injuries while making this yeah. movie and i can't he blame he him. broke his hand like the first couple of days i, I that's that's insane absolutely uh yeah. but, but certainly set him up set him up for the right kind of conviction going forward uh -huh. uh, but it is a very physical performance he at, at the same time he doesn't speak all that much and this is a movie that does have quite a bit of dialogue but it weirdly still feels kind of like a silent film for some reason to me uh, it, I, I mm -hmm. almost feel like if you were to remove the dialogue I don't even know if I would have noticed and that's not because the dialogue's bad it's just the film has a certain vibe and a certain energy that almost feels like it could have functioned as one uh, and I think that's what's really impressive about it is even if I'm not sure of the swings that Dev Patel makes. I mean, I am liking the swings that he is taking because I like the swings in general. If I don't think they always work, one thing he does have from beginning to end is a seamless understanding of what visual storytelling is uh, because there's so much so much happening here visually that's able to tell us what we need to know. And that's probably the most effective thing about it, if you ask me. No, I, I agree. I love the performance. I love what you're talking about there in terms of how much of it is reliant not on dialogue but yeah visual storytelling whether it yeah. be in his performance what he's capturing in frame in camera and especially how that taps into the film's symbolism and spirituality it it is not spoon feeding any of that to the audience right right and if you're not familiar with indian culture or hinduism which mm -hmm. i am not same at times you might feel lost, but I loved that feeling because I, I love the loss. This, it, it, this is not a history afterwards. lesson. And I love that. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I love I, that. It literally drops us right into both the narrative and the world. And it's as if to say to you, this is new to you, right? That's cool. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, it's, well, that's, and that's, that's neat. I agree. That's what I loved so much about the Hanuman symbolism in this film. Yeah. I was not familiar with it before seeing mm -hmm. the movie, but I did find an article where it said, Hanuman epitomizes strength, heroic initiative, and assertive excellence with loving emotional devotion to his Lord Rama. Of mm. course, please forgive me if I'm way off base there. Assuming I'm on the right track, I absolutely love how Patel weaves that into the emotional fabric of this film. Those early scenes with his mother, Neela, telling him tales of Hanuman is so warm and endearing mm -hmm. the flashback scenes later on with the puppetry build upon that. And we get yeah. a deeply poignant sense of not just the worship he has for Hanuman, but how it's connected to his mother. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's obvious for those who practice Hinduism. Honestly, I don't know, but yeah. I love 
how Patel mirrors Bobby as someone who is strong and assertive, who clearly mm-hmm. has a loving emotional devotion to his mother. Yeah. Those parallels, I think, are expertly woven into the character. The film might linger on that symbolism with its visual storytelling, but it isn't hand-holding. Again, it simply no, uses those visuals to emphasize Bobby's spiritual growth and why his worship of Hanuman is important here as it relates to his grief and desperation for revenge. I love that. I think it works in these incredibly incisive ways yeah. that, again, especially as the fight, the, the fighting begins, uh, that, that, that spiritualism is always there in the background. It's the underbelly of the film, which is driving much yeah. of that action. And I found it exquisite. Well, and you know, in any other movie by commercial studio hands, they would have probably depicted Hanuman with this epic backstory to define the entire movie in the third act or something like that. And of yeah. course, we would have gotten a more extensive training montage as opposed to the really hallucinatory one that we get that I think just mm-hmm. adds to the emotional weight of uh, Bobby by the end. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's great visual storytelling, and, and there's certainly a weirdness to that as well. Um I, yeah. I I love everything that you're saying there. That really does you know, it, it's it's that really does play into the symbolism of Hanuman. But it's it's not just what you're talking about. It's also how Hanuman was this liberating figure and the parallels as a liberating figure for the marginalized and how Kid slash Bobby represents that in his own way as well. I think those are again kind of obvious, but it, it's 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 okay to be obvious if you're not being spoon fed how you're supposed to feel about it. Uh, and uh, uh, Dev Patel at least trusts his audience to know how to react to things and to trust us to pay attention mm-hmm. to it, uh, I, yeah. which is what I really do appreciate. I completely agree. I love what you're saying there about the training sequence. That was mm-hmm. one of my favorite elements of the film. Yeah. The way he uses the music there, the drum beat to match. The, the drum dial. Yeah, that was, I, I have no idea what that's called, but that was incredible as, as it's if he's so yeah, good. rhythmically communicating with both the punching bag and the musicality yeah. of their culture behind it. That was like, like so I, good. We, You've I never we, seen a training we, sequence like that before. No, no. And this is what I love so much about the way culture is depicted here, because it never tells us what that means to them. It allows yeah. us to be immersed in the mystery and the unknown. Of course, it'd be great if we go out and look for it ourselves and understand what it means. But the fact that it's kind of provoking us to express an mm-hmm. interest in that unknown is so fascinating. I love the depiction of the alpha character played by uh, Vipin Sharma. I hope we're pronouncing that name right. Uh, as uh, I think it's the Hydra is what they're identified as. Uh, and in Hinduism, I, I guess that and for those listening who know more about this, please correct me if I'm wrong. But these are people that apparently identify as having a third gender. Uh, And I think that's a really interesting thing, knowing that that exists in that culture. It's surprisingly something I didn't really know much about, especially given our sociopolitical times. You would think we would know more about this a little bit. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it it makes it seem as though so much universality is happening over there as it is here. Why are we un why are we like unsure about these things? Why don't we know about these things? There's so many parallels to make between their yeah. world and our world, even if it does look physically different. I I, I think that's a really interesting touch that Dev Patel makes. I, I agree. I mean, much of the film is about oppression, as mm-hmm. the synopsis somewhat alludes to. And I do want to talk about the political subtext of the film here in a moment. But yes, as it relates to Alpha and the transgender woman at the temple they certainly Mm -hmm. have a role to play in terms of what they represent in terms of that political subtext but as we talked about earlier they play this equally pivotal role as it relates to bobby's own arc in Mm -hmm. terms of again being motivated but volatile in his journey of revenge it's not until he has this spiritual transformation which is what I love about that moment between him and Alpha where she offers him this hallucinatory experience that allows him to channel his grief in this new way that is then followed by that training sequence. 
So mm-hmm. I, I again, I love how those two things are married to each other. That training montage would have been a great moment of visual storytelling on its own, but it carries weight. There's thematic yeah. and emotional potency to it because it comes off the heels of this transformation that he has. And then yeah. from there, he's able to take that healing, that transformation and channel it into this John Wick uh, aura ethos in, into the, well, the rest of the I movie was, where he becomes... I was weirdly thinking of Rocky during that and not because yeah. it's similar to Rocky, but just in a high level way, every Rocky movie has a training montage of its own, its own DNA, its own formula, if you will. Yeah. But the commonality is that they're all set to some type of music, some type yeah, of theme. For sure. Yeah. Whether it be a song or Bill Conti's iconic theme. This movie, Monkey Man, kind of does that as, as well. It's just, you know, yeah. it's percussive. It's 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 within the world of their world. It's in, it, it, yeah. and it, it it's I, great. I, I I, I love how it does something we've seen before by doing something we've never seen before. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it does both simultaneously. I agree. I think it's all brilliantly woven into the film. Circling back to the political subtext of the film, okay. I won't pretend to understand all of it, but mm-hmm. for me, it was less about the specificity of it, although I'm sure there is power to it for those that are keen to those politics. For mm-hmm. me... It was what it represents in terms of power and manipulation. The film is chock full of religion and mythology. Did it need to tackle corruption and mistrust of government leaders? Maybe not. But those politics are key to where Bobby is in this film. As his mother was brutally murdered, as those leaders were simply wanting their land, Oppression is at the core of the film, whether it be with Bobby and his mother or, as we noted earlier, the transgender women at the temple. And it all coalesces into this class uprising of sorts in that final act. Again, I don't know if it all works, but I think it works (laughs) way more than it doesn't. And I love what it's aiming for. It's the swing that counts for me. And like... I I do wonder if he removed the political subtext, if this film would have perhaps been a little bit more incisive and diligent in terms of, you know, maybe, you know, giving more room for the emotion of it to breathe or the Um, the, the spiritualism to breathe. I I don't know. But I, I will say this. I think... Uh, I, I, I don't think that it hinders the film. It might keep it from being sure. a full-on masterpiece for me, but I don't think it hinders the film all that much either. Well, I, I, um, and, yeah. I, and again, I love the ambition. Yeah, I, I guess to speak to that, it didn't really bother me too much either. I, I think where it works is it doesn't get bogged down in the political specificities of exactly. who this, you know, th- this party is, essentially what they mean for... India and Mumbai, uh, how that parallels with us in some sort of way. It's really more about those high level overarching themes that you're talking about to find the universality within it. I think if anything, maybe what it could have had less of is maybe some plotting around it because there is a little bit of plotting around who some of those people are and what it means. So maybe it could have like lessened that a little bit, but I think in a general sense, having the political side here is still necessary. Uh, yeah, I, I, just, I agree. Yeah, just to at least do the same thing as what the spiritual side is doing, what the emotional side is doing. I, I agree because it does give additional texture to, you know, the backstory of what happened to his mother, her taking a sure. stance, and ultimately that's why she was murdered. The transgender women at the temple, they're not there to just help Bobby on his way. They play a role as well, being mm-hmm. oppressed by that same government. And so it does give the film additional texture. To me, that's the only part of the film where it's maybe a little disjointed, a little messy. That could have been cleaned up. That's fair. That's fair. And I think it's more of a plotting thing than anything else. But again, like I do like that it's here because it does help. I like that it's here. I I agree. It it does help ground it. It kind of solidifies the world a little bit. I think without it, and we're only focusing more on the spiritual side and the emotional side. For those who are more ignorant to this kind of world, it might seem overly fantastical 
to people. Uh, and, and I think having a political side to it might help ground it a bit more, whether there's authenticity in what it's depicting or not. I think it just helps kind of create a sense of like a foundational sense to this world. Uh, and yeah. weirdly complements the dilapidated setting that you were talking about earlier. I, I, I agree. And it's not overly done here. The politics of this film are pretty kind of secondary, simple, yeah. basic and sec secondary. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it is acting as a political allegory of sorts. I think it's first and foremost about Bobby and his emotional transformation, his spiritual tran transformation. So the politics are secondary, but mm -hmm. I also don't think it's overly convoluted either. It's not. And, yes. and, and to be honest, like, th there's a moment towards the end without getting too heavily into spoilers. This will be vague, so it's not revealing anything. But there is a moment where uh, Bobby does come face to face with a certain baddie, perhaps the main baddie. And this political baddie, figure, this political figure. Yeah. Um, go. And this political figure kind of explains his point of view as if he's almost like revealing a master plan of sorts. Yeah, uh, I'll say this. I don't really remember at all what was said. But it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't. Uh, like, like there's an and that but, but see in another movie that handles it poorly, it might matter. Like if you miss it, then yeah. all of a sudden you find yourself confused as to as to the trajectory of the movie. But in this yeah. case, it doesn't matter. And the fact that it doesn't matter is what I do appreciate about that. It, it's putting more ownership in the things that do matter. Uh, I agree. I, I yeah. completely agree. It does give the film and end goal something to reach in terms of the revenge that Bobby is aiming for mm -hmm. uh, without convoluting the film all that much. I mean, he's simply mm -hmm. this political figure disguised as this spiritual leader who mm -hmm. is going to lead, um, you know, the country into, I don't know, this new spiritual phase. Again, I'm mm -hmm. pretty ignorant to, the current politics of India. So forgive me. Yeah. But yeah. to your point, and I, and I agree with you, it's not about those specificities. Right. Uh, at least, again, for those that are keen to it, I'm sure there is something there. Uh, yeah. For me, it's, it's mostly what it represents in terms of power manipulation. That's what that character that, represents. Yeah, and even if you're not keen to Indian politics, that, is pretty clear. That's very yeah. lucid. And that's that, all that, that is, really yeah. matters here, ultimately. Yeah. I, I will say it made me want to learn and understand a little bit more about it. And sure. that means the no, movie succeeding in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I certainly wanted to look more into it as well. Same thing yeah. with the spiritual core of this film. And, you know, because I, I, have, I did not grow up around any Hindus. I've never practiced Hinduism. I really don't mm -hmm. know much about it. Right. But the way that it is expressed here, at least at the intellectual level, I was curious to to learn more about it because I, I do think it's conveyed in this fascinating way that taps into Bobby's uh, childhood in, yeah. in this fascinating way that has defined him his entire life. Yeah. That I, I, I just think That's comes through in this film brilliantly. Yeah, yeah, it's not a history lesson. It's not Gettysburg no. here. It's, no, it's, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, there's a Which, there's yeah. a spirit. There's an emotional core to it that yeah. I I think comes through great. I think that's what I love so much about the editing of this film because yes, Patel goes back to those flashbacks in 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 parts. I think that what's so great about the editing in the first half of the film is that it's teasing us to some sort of backstory. We get clues, visual clues. In the present mm. day, how that relates back to to these insert shot insert shots of his childhood, mm. and it all coalesces eventually near the third act of the film, and it all plays out in a, a seamless way that makes sense of everything that came before. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th I, this movie. Yeah, sorry. Keep going. I, I was I was just gonna say like that back and forth again. I love it because it clues us into who these characters are and and what they mean to each other mm -hmm. while also not really uh, like, like the ambiguity of the film is, is kind of a false one. Like we know where it's leading to, but he's just mm -hmm. not spoon feeding us uh, that, that story. And, and what I like about that tactic here, the reason I think that really works is that th through that style of editing, he throws in 
that that spiritual symbolism in the middle yeah. of it to yeah. always connect how he how he's tied to these characters in the present, what it means to his upbringing, and mm-hmm. and and especially Nuhanaman and how that impacts the choices he's making every every single day and every yeah. scene. Yeah, and I, I love that for a movie like this that's going to reveal a backstory gradually like that. That's usually a tactic I don't love in movies because I often think that's just there for the audience to build suspense, to deliver a proper twist when the narrative requires it to. But here mm. it kind of solves that issue because something we were talking about earlier is how Dev Patel's filmmaking kind of mirrors the trajectory of his main character that he's also playing. It's why I was sort of a bit like I, I I don't know if I want to criticize that sloppiness I felt in the first half, especially from from a fight sequences, uh, because I think they're kind of deliberately sloppy. I, I think they're almost meant to be hard to follow because okay. that's the mindset of the main character. But like the way that those bits of backstory are revealed, they're kind of in line with where that character is emotionally. Like he's latching yeah. onto it. Like he looks at his hand, so he latches onto a particular moment involving fire. Like the backstory itself, it doesn't reveal itself chronologically. It's kind of scattered uh, Mm -hmm. because each certain point is meant to remind him of something. Uh, So it it does a good job getting away from that usual trick that movies might do that I normally don't like. Uh, So kudos to Dev Patel for finding a way to solve that issue and make it work narratively and emotionally here. I I agree. It all circles back to his emotional volatility. Like when he first sees Rana, you see the grief and anger in the performance, but there's also a small insert shot of, you know, something that's representative of Rana when he was a child. Mm -hmm. You know, mm-hmm. then we get a shot of the him looking at the ring, and then there's an insert insert shot of the ring. Like, and and I agree, yeah. it, it's a little scattered, but it all tethers back to his his emotional core. And right. and again, we kind of know pretty much from the beginning. Even if you didn't read the synopsis, and I certainly didn't going mm-hmm. into this film, you know. You, you know what's motivating him. You know what's driving him. It's not right. as if it's a surprise. The, and the film doesn't treat it as if no. it's this huge twist or right. reveal. It just builds to that moment in the third act where it just kind of pieces everything together mm-hmm. in, a, in a much more cogent way. But, uh, yeah, it's not a reveal. It, it just If anything, it, it, just, be, yeah. it brings lucidity to his emotional... Uh, his emotional journey and his spiritual mm-hmm. one, especially yeah. as it relates to the Hanuman, which again, I, I yeah. love here. So yeah, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I, I have to say, JD conversation is making me like the film a little bit more. I'm still not 100% sure how I feel about those uh, fight sequences in the first half, because I think they are deliberate, but at the same time, admittedly watching them in the theater, I was, I had no idea what was going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, but, but again, that could have been me not, like physically prepared for what Dev Patel was going to yeah. do. Uh, it was, it, yeah. it, it has a very disorienting feel in a way that does feel kind of new. Uh, and I might have to give him some That's credit fair. for that as well. I mean, I, I, I think the choreography here is pretty excellent. It okay. does perhaps have this improvised kinetic energy to it. The camera mm-hmm. isn't afraid to move, perhaps channeling a little Michael Bay. <laughs> Yeah, go back to that conversation. The camera is it, not it all comes to move. back to Michael Bay. It all comes is, back is, is, to Michael Is this gonna be the new gimmick does. of our podcast? Is somehow every movie we talk be. about comes back to Michael Bay? Every the next Scorsese film somehow circles back to Michael Bay. Uh but that'd be you know, a fun I, gimmick for a podcast. Oh my goodness. It would be. <laughs> I love the camera work here, as I noted. I love the choreography of the fighting sequences, and I just did not have that reaction. I did okay. sense the kinetic energy of it, but I was able to, to you know, keep keep up with everything that was happening in the moment. Okay, okay, fair um, enough. And I, again, I, I loved it, especially because of the 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 style in which it's shot. Of course, there's the, the composition and framing of it, but Mm -hmm. The color palette, the way that he'll zoom in on something very specific before, 
you know, having this quick edit to something that is happening quickly and frenetically. Like it's yeah. just, to me, it's, it's an, it, I, I loved it. I just, I love the filmmaking. I love the, editing. I can tell. I, I love I how much you great. loved it. And I really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. You know, and, and also like, especially as the film progresses, the fighting seems to heighten itself in terms of that choreography. It gets quite bloody and intense at times. I mean, it there's does. one point in this film where he kills a guy by shoving a knife into that guy's throat using his teeth. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's like, honestly kind of hilarious. It, th this movie yeah. is kind of tongue in cheek in that way when it's getting really violent and plays with that violence. It's, it's really doing a good job cueing you as the audience in. Okay. It's okay to laugh at this. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I think it's, it's okay to recognize that. It, it certainly takes itself more seriously than something like the beekeeper, for example, or <laughs> something of that elk, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it isn't afraid to have fun with a lot of those sequences as well. I mean, I think about mm -hmm. that moment when they're at the hostel near the end of the film and he's surrounded by like 50 guys. And then yeah. I guess, spoiler alert here. This, this, this is genuinely a little bit of a spoiler. Maybe I'll be vague okay. here. But he's surrounded by a bunch of guys. Then let's say something else enters the chat. If you've oh, okay. seen the film, you know yeah, what, I, I, what I'm talking about. And I, I, okay. that on its own terms, I think, is it's heightened to this degree that I think mostly works in terms of the uh, oppression of the film, like the real, the political allegory of it. It mostly works in that regard. Uh, than I think anything else, because it is, I, I don't want to say silly, but it is a little, it's just less serious than the rest of it. And and it's it, having yeah, a it's, lot of fun. It's very the loud. The film is having a lot of fun. Yeah, the loudness of it, I think, certainly adds to that level of fun. The, the literal screaming that happens, and it's yeah. it, it's it's not screaming with fear. It's, it, yeah. it, it's, it's a certain type of yelling <laughs> that happens that yeah. uh, it really does cue you in that, okay, you can have some fun with this. Go ahead. This is this, this I, kind of I rules. Agree. Yeah. And the other thing too, I love about the fighting in this film is how monkey man, how Bobby is treated in that final act where mm -hmm. he channels his John Wick powers, if you will, mm -hmm. because he's extremely formidable. And it, of course it comes off the heels of that spiritual transformation and his foreboding qualities are quite antithetical to who he is at the beginning of the film. I, I do agree with you at the very mm -hmm. least. He's not, he knows how to fight, but he's not the greatest of fighters. No, we'll say. And he's I too busy that. kind of receiving pain than giving pain. At that yes. Point. And that it, makes it, sense it, for his character. It's at the time. both sides of that coin for sure. Yeah. At the end of the film, I do love how Patel mostly leans into those foreboding qualities Right. right. Like it, it'd be real easy. I think a lot of action films still, even as he's facing the main baddie of the film, it's this back and forth tug of war. And right. at the very end, he kills the guy. That yeah. is not how Bobby is treated in this film. He no. might take a few punches there in that final fight, but it is him dominating his opponent. And right. I do right. love that because it fits the 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 spiritual and emotional underbelly of this film and mm -hmm. and why those things are important like those things carry sure. a lot of weight here if he went back to the same fighting style or the same fighting abilities as it was before like those things don't carry weight so sure. i i do love that patel as a filmmaker was thinking about those things yeah like yeah. you know a first time filmmaker especially coming from acting not directing could probably overlook that mm -hmm, to some degree, mm -hmm. but he does. Yeah. And, and I do, I, I really appreciate that. And it's, and film. it's interesting that this is the kind of first film he's going to make Dev Patel, uh, because yeah. you look at his history, it's not really like this. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. it, it's, 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 it's kind of a coincidence that Jordan Peele is the main producer on this and his production company is what really helped get it seen. Because when Jordan Peele first made Get Out, we never associated that type of film with someone like Jordan Peele from Key exactly. and Peele, right? Yeah. So it's kind of a similar narrative behind the that camera. Is, I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, that is a fun little irony. And 
I know we brought it up earlier. You spoke to it in your opening thoughts, I believe, but it, mm-hmm. it is stunning that this film exists at all. It had a troubled production. Yeah. Partially because Dev Patel broke his hand three days into shooting, two days yeah. into shooting. It had an extremely low budget. I think they made this for something like $10 million. Yeah. And then Netflix decided to quietly sell sell it off, and it left the film mm-hmm. in limbo for a while until Jordan Peele came to the rescue. There was yeah. a lot working against it. Yeah. Yet, despite that, somehow it turned out to be this phenomenal action movie. Like, I understand why a Jordan Peele would see this and be like, this needs to be seen in theaters. Pronto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, Jordan Peele's a good dude. Incredible. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and I hope to see it. Just, just for those reasons that we talked about, it's going to stimulate a lot of good conversation. Do you have any final thoughts here? Before we I, I, just, I just want to I just want to comment once again. You look at this cast, and this is a movie that's apparently doing pretty well uh, like financially at this point, given that low... But I want you to maybe check the numbers as I'm talking, because I honestly don't know for yeah. sure how well it's I'll actually it doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, but you did mention its budget there being only something around $10 million, which is pocket change for most movies nowadays especially yeah. ones you know produced by jordan peele um yeah. but you look at that cast that's insane that a movie like this exists and exists in a commercial spectrum where mm. you you know basically nobody here and i find that so cool I, I i love that i love that idea i love that experience um so even if i'm not fully in love with the movie as you are i say that yet I love that this movie exists in this way. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I, yeah, I lo- love this film. And sorry, I'm talking and looking up numbers at the same time. Maybe so I could this, do that. This has a worldwide box office so far of thirteen point three million dollars. Mm, um, okay. I don't know how much of an international release it's had so far. I would imagine not much. Yeah, and obviously, it's only been in theaters. Uh, the one weekend here in the United States. I also yeah. want to know how many theaters it was in because I don't know mm. if this was a fully wide release. Maybe it was. It might Maybe not it have was been. in like yeah, 4,000 theaters. I don't know. Right now it's showing, yeah, as you said, what, up to 13? I think some publications are showing 12 point something, but that was a few days ago. So there's still uh, some updates to make to that. Um, yeah, that's that actually isn't I'll, that great. I would love to know like how many theaters it was in though. Oh man. Yeah. Hope it got distributed properly. Uh, okay. So according to this, this is from deadline. I, I don't okay. know if this is the right number, but what I see here is 3000 theaters. Okay. Which isn't small. Like that's, that's a decent. No, amount. that, 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 that's, that's pretty middle of the road, I think, but it's not small. It's not minuscule. Yeah. yeah so, um, you know, hmm. I don't, maybe it was a marketing thing. I don't know how much market. Huh? I don't, they didn't play this on TV or anything, did they? No, but maybe I'll have legs. Maybe there'll be yeah. word of mouth for it. I hope so. And maybe, I don't know, ironic, I guess. Since I guess Netflix so. Gave this up. Maybe it will find legs once it comes to streaming. <laughs> once it finally oh, hits Netflix, if it does, I really, I really hope that doesn't happen. As much as I want people to see this, I and know. it does, need, but I don't want it to fuel the streaming wars further. In that regard, I don't either. <laughs> I, 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 I agree with you. Hopefully, the word of mouth is great and people go see it. That's yeah. first and foremost. Watch, like um, in, in 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 like five or six months, it becomes another Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. You know, like Elemental, right? Elemental was slow out yeah, of that, the gates that, that, and then that, went yeah, on a huge the, run. The, the reports were so premature for that one, saying it was a failure. And then exactly. all of a sudden, like a month or so later, it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So who's who's to say? Maybe that's the people the are who to say, for the So film. go see it. Yeah. I, I, I just want to reiterate as a, as a few final thoughts, Dev Patel's performance is really good here. I do yeah, agree. love him in front of the camera. Charto Copley, love his sleazy portrayal here. He's really great in those greasy kind of roles. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It's good to see him on screen once again as well. Um, you know, Sikander Kerr, I think, is serviceable here, good in a small role. Uh, mm-hmm. Vipin Sharma is, is fantastic. 
Loved he's really that good. performance. He's really good. Yeah, really, really fantastic. Um, and then I, I just want to reiterate how much I love the cinematography here, how much I love mm-hmm. the filmmaking, the editing, and the a- ambition of it. Maybe it doesn't sure. all work, but I loved it. I love the swings. Mm-hmm. I love the way it infuses that spiritual symbolism throughout the film, what that means to the character, and 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 the fact that Patel refuses to let that slide away. That is always yeah. top of mind. And I think that's what's so emotionally invigorating about the final sequence of this film where you get that final kill, but the film doesn't want to linger on that. Like, that's not the last thing. It mm-hmm. all circles back to why he was in this position to begin with. What was he fighting for? Yeah. Him thinking about his mother, thinking about those memories of him as a child, hearing about the Hanuman, how that became a thing of worship for him, a defining trait of his character, and 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 obviously a cipher for much of the transformation he has throughout a lot of this film. Yeah. And he interjects that, Patel does as a filmmaker, with more of those insert shots of his mother, of the Hanuman iconography Mm -hmm. and and all of these various ways. Right. That is what he is thinking about there in those final moments. Right. That uh, I think is great. And then, and of course it ends on, I guess you can call it some ambiguity, which is why Uh, I agree. I don't want to see a sequel. Like I just don't want an answer to it. I think it ends impeccably. I, I was going to make a comparison to another movie, but I'm not going to because I don't want to spoil anything. But I, I'll tell you offline, JD. I'll tell you offline. But <laughs> Fair if, enough. If, if, if this movie is ambiguous in its ending, so is this other movie that I'm thinking of. And this okay. other movie I'm thinking of has already been confirmed to not be ambiguous. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Fair enough. I think it can be read either way. And mm. I think the film is effective regardless. Okay. Because of that emotional underbelly, how that props everything up, uh, mm. which I, I love. I think it's great. I, I, I deeply love this film. Like I said, this is top 10 of the year uh, quality for me. Whether it wow. lands there or not is yet to be seen. There is wow. so much okay. else to, to see this year. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? If 2024 is as deep of a year as 2023 was, Maybe it will find itself on the outside looking in. I don't know, but that's how high I am on it. As it that's incredible, currently. yeah. So okay, so the year is finally taking off after your words a few weeks ago. I, I think it was that's that 2024 really is not great so far. <laughs> it's <laughs> well, and yeah. I think what's really funny about that too. Dune is great. Obviously, I love Dune. That's probably top ten, top twenty caliber for me as well. Mm. So I have those two. There's another film that we're about to review coming up soon that I'm also pretty high on. Spoiler alert. I know I don't know if it's I don't know if it's top twenty this. worthy, but I'm pretty high on it. So it's either it's way. It's certainly it can, top twenty worthy now, based it, on top what twenty. You've seen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At this point, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, it does seem as if I I jinxed the year. Maybe in a good well, way. Good. Because it more ever often. since making those <laughs> statements, this year is taking <laughs> off. Yeah. Uh, at any oh, rate, I loved Monkey us. Man. Loved okay. it. Cannot cool. wait to see it again. Uh, if you agree or disagree with anything we had to say here, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment below. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd. You can email us in sessionfilm at gmail.com. If you're watching mm-hmm. on uh, on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, all that fun stuff. If you're listening... Yeah. Via audio, uh, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, however you're listening. Mm -hmm. Uh, We would really greatly appreciate that. And I believe that is it. Am I I missing anything? I believe that's it. I'm just proud of myself for not referencing two Monkey Man-related things during this conversation until now. Jay, did you ever watch Hey Arnold growing up when you were a kid on Nickelodeon? Uh, Yeah, for sure. Okay, remember that there was like a random kid that lived in their neighborhood. He popped up in like two episodes, but he dressed as a superhero. His name was Monkey Man. Oh, no, I do not remember that. (laughs) For all the Nickelodeon heads out there, I know it's not really a great talking point given that documentary on Max right now, but for those that grew up with the animated shows like Hey Arnold, 
you'll probably get my reference there. So there's that. Yeah. And of course, I didn't start singing Monkey Man by the Rolling Stones from 1969. I almost did that, but I'm glad the movie doesn't do it either. That has no place in a cultural representation like this. Wow. Yeah, I would not have thought of that. Just had to throw my random thoughts out there. That's what final thoughts are for. They're meant to be. Yeah, exactly. I I will say this. I actually have another genuine criticism. Maybe my only genuine criticism of this movie. You know, like I talked about how there are elements that I don't know if, like, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't all work. It worked for me, but I can concede that maybe some of it is a little disjointed. The one genuine criticism I have of this film is Jed Kurzel, who does the score here. And I love the music on the whole. However, he uses the Top Gun bells. Oh, he does. I don't know if anyone I noticed that. that. I thought about that. He uses the, the same, Top Gun bells. So the, the whole time pitch. I'm it's waiting, same, I'm waiting it's for the, the donation. Bell. It's the same thing. I have the, expected yeah. to hear, you know, that great score from Top Gun yes. Reserve. It's no, you're you're not wrong. I thought yeah. of that as well. I can't believe I forgot that. Yeah, I was waiting for that Top Gun theme to kick in, and I'm like, why am I like, what is going on here? Why am I anticipating Top Gun to oh. show up? Like, I was waiting for Maverick oh. to be a part of this movie at some point. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the it's, same pitch. It's the exact it's same the same pitch. thing. Yeah, it's it's the same bells, but it just kicks into a different theme. It it, it is admittedly very distracting to me. <laughs> like I was, yeah, I think very it's um. Hang on, I'm moment. trying to figure it out. I'm trying to let my good relative pitch kind of compare the two to see if they are this. I I think they are the same. I think it's I think that note is either a B flat or a B. I I, I it's, think that it it's sounds the same thing. verbatim to me. <laughs> it is the same, the same, the same, same thing. Same tone, same bell. As far as as far as I'm no, concerned, no, you're you're not wrong. I thought about that as well. I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I yeah. totally forgot about it for this conversation. Yeah, because my walking out of the theater, I was like, that is the only thing I can criticize. I loved everything. It else. was distracting. You're right. That yeah. was it, my it, only it, criticism. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's when Death Patel's behind the fence. He's about to try shooting his. Yeah, gun that's the- that's that's yeah. part of it. Yeah, I wow. think it plays like early, early on too. But it's very prominent during that sequence too. Yeah, with the gun. Yeah, I think it's even the same so, tempo. Like they land on the same beats and everything. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's the same rhythm. Like he he like lets that bell just kind of linger in the same way you hear with the yeah, top gun. It sounds theme. like a sample or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like wow. maybe that wasn't meant to well, be in the final rendition. Like that was just there as like uh all right, I don't know. Keep this here well, until I figure my, out what I want to do, and then he just my, left it in. My thought at first, in order to justify its existence in some way, was that it was the bell from Top Gun, the same thing, but maybe it was sampled in some type of song, maybe a hip hop song or something, and that was going okay. to play. In I could that buy moment. that. Yeah, but it doesn't. It just, you know, no. it, it, it retains Jed Krizel's usual score. Uh, so yeah. it, yeah, so it doesn't. That's a funny yeah. thing. Yeah, I yeah, can't it, believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was so funny, so distracting. And. I don't know. I feel like Top Gun, especially Top Gun Maverick, yeah. was such a huge hit from just a few years ago that it's still top of mind for a lot of people sure. that surely we're not the only ones to to feel that way right, <laughs> about it. Right. I mean, it's ultimately a small criticism, but one that you, you can't help but notice. Like, it is a little yeah. distracting. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's, anyway. that's incredible. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great <laughs> way to end the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Great movie, though. Great movie. Do love it. Hope, yeah, hopefully people yeah. go and check it out. And all 13 million at the box office. Let's triple Let's make that it 30. over the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, with that said, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the In Session Film Podcast. Uh, what a great directorial debut. Monkey Can't wait for his next one.